Uh, I want to welcome everybody who has made it a, a priority of being here uh, this evening. And those of us, or those of you who perhaps are the first time uh, in, in the conferences or, or in a church, we're also very happy to see you as well. This evening, my secondary objective is, is, uh, is to be brief, but not at the expense of, of God's impact through His Word. You see, God does not need long passages of time or, or, or lengthy words to make impact and to change people's lives. We see that Jesus, using just one sentence, He has changed the life of a criminal. When the criminal was taking his last breaths, Jesus changed his life. The life that was bound to be sinful and the life and the outcome that he really did deserve in the end. But just one sentence at the right time and Jesus saved his life. It also took Jesus only three words. If you recall, there's a passage in the Bible where uh, Jesus was sleeping and, and, and he said only three words to calm the storm. Peace, be still. And that's another reminder for us that, that God's word is very powerful, and it does not need God a lot of, a lot of words or, 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 or a lot of time to make impact on our lives today. And I want us to really keep in mind that you know, we're, we're here, here gathered for a reason. And maybe today God just needs to use a couple of words through the messages that are going to be spoken to change your life, to change your current situation. And what is necessary from us is to believe that God is ready and he's able to do great things and to change our lives. I'd like to jump right into to the Word of God, and I'm going to read the same passage that, that we've seen on, on brochures and the same passage that we already read earlier today. It's the passage that, uh, that is written in the New Testament. It's going to be Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Uh, you can follow along, and I'm using English Standard Version for translation. If you don't have your Bibles with me, that is okay. I brought mine, so I'll read it for you. And he said to all, if, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I call my sermon tonight, The Path of Least Resistance. Now, we, we all most likely have heard in the past the phrase, uh, the path of least resistance. Uh, I think most of us have. Uh, but the path of least resistance, is, it's, a, it's a human behavioral concept where we tend to do what, what is most convenient. Uh, take, a, for example, water in a cup and pour the water in the cup and, and, and the water takes the shape of the cup. So it follows the path of least resistance. Another example that I think uh, makes more sense for, 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 for young people here, uh, the path of least resistance is, is when we hit the snooze button on Monday mornings. That is where uh, most people want to sleep in more, uh, don't want to go to school or maybe work. And, and there's always that temptation to follow the path of least resistance, the path of most convenience and, and what is desirable for us to do. But our Christian lives cannot follow the same path of least resistance. It cannot. We're not supposed to. And Apostle Paul, he's writing to Romans. There's, there's one verse that I think most people are familiar with. And Apostle Paul says, For I do not understand my own actions. I don't understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Every human has this dilemma. We know what is right, but it's, it's very difficult for us to do because our flesh demands something else from us. In our Christian lives, our walk with God is that path of most resistance because our flesh wants what's contradictory to what God has asked from us. And, and the toughest battles, and I think most people know and experience, the toughest battles that we fight are the battles within ourselves. It's the battles with our flesh, saying no to ourselves. And that is precisely the reason why most diets fail, for example, is because it's very difficult to say no to your own cravings and to hold yourself accountable. It is precisely the reason why most New Year's resolutions fail as well of, of going to the gym, and most of them fail within, within a couple of months, is because people, humans, they tend to revert back to its, to its natural, easy way of going. But the stories of all great men in the Bible that we read, 
They're the stories of the path that they follow, the path of most resistance in our lives. And I believe in my heart that, that God wants to talk to us today and reiterate the purpose for the path that he has embarked us on, the path that we take. And every great man in the Bible, they, they, they all had one thing in common. They had that difficult path to follow. You see, the difficulty of the path closely correlates to the outcome that we get. And the difficulty of the path that we take strengthens our faith in Jesus. Apostle Paul writes to Hebrews, and there's a verse, and he says, he who promised is faithful. He writes to Hebrews, let us hold fast, fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The Jesus, God, who promised to be with us throughout our, 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 our path is faithful to complete it for us, with us. The more difficult the path, the path that, that you're walking on gets, the more certain you can be that you're on the right track. That's, 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 a, that's a one way of knowing that you're on the right track. If it gets difficult, just know you're on the right track. You know, before Joseph in, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, before Joseph became a prime minister of, of Egypt, a, a great country, at, at the point, the, the biggest and the greatest country, an, an economic powerhouse uh, of the Old Testament, you know, he was betrayed by his brothers. The path was extremely difficult. He was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold in slavery. He was put to prison. And, and he had to take a look at his life and, and probably think that you know, his life is not going to get any better before it gets any worse. A young man put in prison, slave, but with faith and, and commitment and commitment to God has overcome all the odds. And that example teaches us that Although all the odds could be against us on our path, and, and we might not see the outcome of the path that we're taking on, as long as we have Jesus on our side, the probabilities are just mere statistics. The odds are just mere statistics, and the probability of success becomes 100 as long as we have God on our side. In Luke chapter 9 that we just read, Jesus says to all, if anyone would come after me. When somebody makes a decision, and most of us have made the decision to follow Jesus. We need to accept that he comes first. Jesus says, who follows or if anybody comes after me. How many of us have gone on hikes before? Um, I, I go on hikes very infrequently, maybe once a decade. But however, when I do go on hikes, I typically I'm not, I'm not the person that's leading it. And, and, you know, when you go on hikes, there's typically two different people. So there's, there's the ones that, that, that lead the pack, and then there's the ones that are following. And there's a big difference. If you're leading, they, they, you need to be certain of the path that you're taking on because there's a lot more people that are relying on you. You need to know the end result, and you need to know the path that you're taking on. When you're the follower, there's, there's a couple things that are needed from you. Number one is do not lose track of, of the one who's leading, and number two, keep up. What about our walk with Jesus? It's, it's exactly the same way. Do I have a clear sight of Jesus in front of me on the path that I'm following? And Jesus is, is, is God, and he knows the path. He knows the path that, 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 that he has chosen for us. And sometimes we as followers of Jesus, we may may we make question the specific situation and God, why... Why are we taking this path? And this path is more difficult. And I, I don't see the outcome. And, and why does it get so difficult? But we, need to, we have to trust Jesus in the process that, that he who promised is faithful to fulfill his promise, promise. And sometimes in life, and young people and old people all equally, sometimes in life we decide to take matters into our own hands. And instead of walking after Jesus, we try to get ahead. We look to compare paths of, of, of people around us and, and we question, Jesus, why does my path have to be so different? I'll take matters into my own hands. And then we start following the path of least resistance. And then at some point in life, we turn around and, and recognize that Jesus is not following us. God has called us to follow him. He will not follow us on our paths. Ask yourself a question. Do I allow Jesus to guide me on my path? Am I following Jesus daily on the path that he has embarked me on? Do I trust Jesus that he knows 
my path and the outcome of my path. Uh, of my path. There's an awesome story in the Bible that I, that I want to finish with today, uh, and the story that really hits home for me and, and was a revelation to me uh, when I was meditating on, on the Word of God and, and taking a look at, at, at my own path in life. The story um, of Jacob, you know, it's an Old Testament story of Jacob, and, and Jacob had some missteps in his life. Things were not smooth in his life. It's easy knowing the outcome of the Bible to forget how difficult the path of a human being was. And Jacob was a, was a, was a man that was always on the move, uh, and, and in many cases he was always on the move against his own will. We know that when, when uh, he was younger, uh, you know, the future looked really bright for Jacob. Uh, you know, he lived in, in his dad's house. And, and at some point, he decided to lie to his father to get the blessing that was intended for, for the firstborn son. And after that, he had to run away. He has to run away. At that point, his future looks bleak. He, he lied to his father. There's an unknown, the, the great unknown in his life. And, and there's, a, there's a point where he stops, and uh, it's called Ladder to Heaven, if you recall, where God speaks to him in a dream. As Jacob is running away somewhere in the desert, and he's probably calculating what have I done, and what does the life look like ahead of me, God speaks to him in a dream. And what's interesting is God finds him in that desert and reiterates the promises that God will be with him. And I want us to read uh, the chapter, uh, Genesis is going to be chapter 20, 28, verse 16. It says, surely the Lord is in this, uh, it's, it's Jacob uh, saying after the dream, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. How often does God speak to us in the most difficult situations where, where we don't deserve him? God spoke to Jacob after he lied to his father in the middle of the desert where he was left alone. How often does God speak to us when we feel like we've been left alone, when we feel like we least deserve his promises, and God just reiterates the promises? And I'm a true believer that, that God wants to reiterate his promises to you today, what he has promised for you in your life. The path you're taking on, it's the path that God blesses, as long as you stay close to him. Jacob was a young guy in this situation, and he says, how awesome is this place? He called the place Bethel, or God's house. He thought this was the place where God dwells. You know, this is the place where God dwells all the time, and he moved on. He oriented God to this place of Bethel where God opened up to him. Decades later, we find Jacob returning back to the same place. He was returning back as an, as an old man, no, no longer a, a young uh, person. He returns back after years of experience and, and uh, after his life has taken a, a difficult turn, he's seen blessings of God and he returns back to Bethel. Uh, the first time he went to Bethel, he was running away and, and, and the second time he was, he was crippling back. We know that he fought with an angel and uh, he got injured. So he returns back to the place where God has opened up to him. And in verse 35, 3, uh, Genesis, he says these words, um, I'll, I'll read from the second, uh, second, second passage. Um, let's just read it all. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. The God who has been me, with me wherever I have gone. Now an experienced man of God has seen the hand of God in every step of the way, whereas a young person, he thought that Bethel was the place where God has resided. You know, Jesus is with us wherever we go, if we follow him. Jesus is Emmanuel, or, or God, with us. He does not just dwell in one place, he dwells in our heart. And maybe today is the day, and maybe today is the moment where, where God wants to open up to you in this place. Like to Jacob, he opened up, but then he dwelled 
in, in, in Jacob's uh, heart, and Jacob realizes that wherever I have gone, Jesus or God, you have been with me. Sometimes our paths in life may feel very rough, and, and sometimes it may feel unfair, and we may question, why am I being, being, being on this path and, and following Jesus, and, and things are difficult, and I, I don't see the outcome, I don't see the progress. But l- let me tell you that none of the, uh, of the great men of God and uh, none of the ones that have committed their life to Jesus have ever come second when they put God first. And we have to be faithful that God who started and the author of our faith is, is, is faithful to finish it in us. And we need to take heart and not lose hope that, that God will be with us. You know, we always like great outcomes in our lives, and we're also always striving for the greatest outcomes in our lives, and we want to be very successful, but very few of us realize how difficult the process is to get there. And we need to stay true to the process and tr- stay true to the path that God has laid out in front of us and, and stay commit- committed. How many people would like to switch spots with Noah, for example? The path was very difficult. The outcome was great. He's, a, he's a, in the Bible, and, and we see that, that he built a ship that, that saved the humanity at the time. But the process was difficult. People were pointing fingers at him, and, and the process was difficult to get there. How many people would, would swap places with Abraham where he went into the land that was unknown, and some people thought, what are you doing? You have a family, and you need to raise your uh, cattle and, and raise your business, but he has trusted God. And it was an unknown path, but he trusted Jesus. How many people would, would trade spots with David or, or Job who was sick? The outcomes were great, but are we really trusting the process today? I want to ask us all to, to stand up and pray and, 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 and ask God, God, this, this, this path that you have given in my life, Reiterate your promises to me here today and recommit yourself to God today. In his name be glorified. Amen.